Hannah opened her eyes. Here's another new morning, and how many more are to come? The bright sunbeam slipped onto her pillow, but it brought no happiness. Her heart clenched with longing. I have a roof over my head. My son is growing up and making me proud of him. I have a job, also. She persuaded herself, but it didn't help at all. Her gaze drifted over the whitewashed ceiling. Roger had painted it. I wish I could take back that time, even for a few moments, just to come over, hold him, breathe in his scent, and feel the warmth of his hands. Hannah glanced at her watch and threw back the blanket. There was no time to lie down. It was time for her son to get up for school, and she had to tidy herself up, prepare breakfast, then run to work. Hannah met Roger right after graduation. After school, she went to the city to enter college. Honestly speaking, Hannah didn't want to study. It was boring, with too many lessons, strict teachers, dull paragraphs. Instead, she wanted to wear a beautiful dress and go for a walk with the girls. Hannah didn't want to apply for college, but her mother insisted. You've decided to work as a maid and, like me, to count pennies. No, my daughter, you should keep studying to get a better life than me," said Helen, Hannah's mother. Of course, Helen understood everything perfectly well. Her mother had worked on a farm all her life, taking care of poultry, and she also managed to work part time. Helen made clothes for her family and acquaintances. The woman's hands were golden. She wanted her only daughter to make it in the world and get a good education. As for Hannah. She chose what seemed to her the simplest speciality: elementary school teacher. She moved into a dorm room with two other girls, Claire and Brianna. Many years have passed, but they were still friends, and Hannah had no one closer than her favorite girls. At first, Hannah was disappointed with her studies; endless notes made her dizzy, and she even considered withdrawing. But her first school practice changed everything. Hannah found it surprisingly easy to connect with the kids and explain the material. She began studying, not just for getting a diploma, but to become an excellent specialist. And then, in her third year, she met Roger. Claire and Brianna invited her to a disco, and she went to reward herself for good grades and unwind. She didn't notice Roger right away. He was ordinary-looking, thin and short. Hannah didn't want to dance with him, but his hopeful look made her give in. She didn't know why she was drawn to him. For the whole evening, he stayed close, laughing and talking about his technical school and classmates, and how he looked at her. Naturally, Roger offered to walk her to the dormitory, and she agreed, whispering to her friends that she was leaving. Hannah wasn't afraid. She sensed that this guy was different from all the others, as if made from a different mold. They walked slowly to the dormitory, talking about everything and nothing. Fluffy snowflakes swirled gently. The city glowed with holiday lights, and Hannah felt so calm and content. The next day, they went to the park. Roger bought ice cream. Nobody eats ice cream in winter, Hannah laughed. And you and I will to remember this day forever, the guy said, winking. Roger had been visiting Hannah. Almost every day, he'd pick her up after classes and they'd go for walks. And of course, at some point, she even began to study less. How could she concentrate when all her thoughts were with Roger? It was as if they were truly two halves of a whole. He'd start a sentence and she'd finish it. They liked the same movies and music, dreaming of a big happy family. I'm the only child in my family, so I want at least two, Roger said. He adored children, and Hannah felt he'd be a great father. When Hannah graduated, she took Roger to her native village to meet her mother. He made a good impression on his future mother-in-law. During his three-day visit, Roger didn't sit idle. He chopped a month's worth of firewood, repaired the fence, and fixed the sockets. He's a worker, her mother said. If you want to marry him, I give my blessing. Thus, when Roger proposed. Hannah was overjoyed, as if wings had sprouted behind her. By then, Roger's mother had married a man, leaving her son a tiny house in suburbia. 
After selling it, Hannah and Roger bought a small house in her settlement, with a nice yard and bathhouse. They lived happily. Hannah worked as an elementary school teacher, and Roger worked on the farm as an electrician. They lived well, went to town, bought new clothes, and once Roger gave Hannah a bottle of real French perfume. She laughed. Where would I wear perfume in the village? Roger replied, You're the most beautiful, and you should smell better than anyone else. Hannah kept the perfume. Sometimes she'd take out the heavy bottle, breathe in its fragrance of happiness and serenity, and cry into her pillow. I should give this perfume to Claire or Brianna. I always cry at the memories. On the other hand, it's all I have left of Roger, of my former happy life. Then there's Luke, a copy of Roger. Eyes, voice, even facial expressions are the same. Can it be? It's fortunate we had time to have a son. Otherwise, I would be alone now. When Hannah was five months pregnant, her mother died. She kept complaining about her heart, but didn't hurry to the hospital. Summer, vegetable garden, household chores. She didn't have a minute to spare. Hannah found her mother herself. She came in after work for some reason, and there she was, lying on the floor with her arms spread out, looking up at the ceiling with a slightly surprised expression. God only knows how Hannah survived it all. It was good that Roger was around. She had to live for him and their future child. Hannah gave birth to a healthy, strong boy right on time. They named him Luke. Hannah doted on the baby, and Roger was such a caring and loving father. Luke seemed to grow not by days, but by hours. Admiring his son, Roger talked more and more about having a second child. He still wanted a daughter. Hannah's mother-in-law began visiting more often to babysit her grandson. Annette looked down on her daughter-in-law. She liked it when Hannah obeyed her unconditionally. From her first visits, she began to establish her own order in her son's house. Hannah disliked her mother-in-law, knowing that after the death of her first husband, Roger's father, the woman was focused solely on her personal life, practically ignoring her son. She had no luck in her personal life. Until she met her current husband, Hannah, having become a mum, promised herself that Luke would always be her priority, no matter what happened in their lives. And then grief came to her house again. It was Luke's fourth birthday. Hannah remembered that day vividly. It was a beautiful spring day. She finished cooking dinner, took her son by the hand and left the house. They walked along the country road, looking for Roger coming home. But instead of her husband, Pavel, a colleague of her husband, was walking toward her. Hannah, hello, he began, and for some reason the woman turned cold when she saw the man's eyes. Let's go inside, I have something to say. What's the matter with Roger? What happened? Hannah squeezed her son's hand so much that the boy shrieked in surprise. Hannah, I'm sorry. The paramedic came, but it was too late. They were changing the wiring. Something shorted out, and Roger... Can you hear me? Hannah, are you okay? She heard his voice, as if from afar, settling on the dusty country road. Roger's gone? How will I live without him? Flashed through her mind before she fainted. In the morning, her mother-in-law arrived. Glaring angrily at her daughter-in-law, the woman hissed at Anna's quiet greeting. It's all because of you! But, but why do you say this? Because he worked days and nights, Annette continued. He never saw the light of day. Everything to pamper you, and you just sat at home. If it weren't for you... My son would still be alive. Hannah said nothing then, listened silently and went to her son. Sometimes she herself thought she was to blame for her husband's death. So Hannah was left alone in the world, without a husband, without a mother. Only her son was growing up. Luke, her light, her joy. Eight years had passed since his death. Luke had grown up, but he was acting out a lot, growing up without his father's supervision, 
not obeying his mother at all, and Hannah couldn't scold her son. How could she scold him when she wanted to hug him and stroke his head? Having washed her face, the woman entered her son's room. Get up, Luke, Hannah said, opening the curtains. The boy was asleep. On the floor lay a flashlight, and on the pillow a book, Robinson Crusoe. Luke, you'll be late for school. Okay, Mum, just one more minute. Did you read all night again? Not all night, just half. Luke got out of bed and started warming up, squatting and waving his arms. Hannah smiled and went to make breakfast. When did he grow up so fast? It seemed like just yesterday he was a baby, and now he's into pirates and astronauts. He's making planes out of cardboard. He'll bring home a bride soon enough. Hannah turned on the stove, put the coffee on and poured four eggs into a frying pan. Today, she had a free day, a day off, even though it was Wednesday. She could clean up, do laundry and cook something tasty. By evening, Bill promised to come by. Will he? He's a master at talking, but he doesn't always get to the point. Hannah poured herself some coffee, sat down across from her son and watched him eat. Luke was devouring his scrambled eggs with gusto. After breakfast, he stood up, kissed his mother on the cheek and went off to school. Hannah went to the window to see him off. An inexplicable longing tugged at her heart. What if one day he packs up and leaves? Not to school, but to another life as an adult. And she'll be all alone. Bill? Why did she get involved with him? Bill was known as the local Don Juan, always with one woman or another. As soon as he divorced his wife, he started going out. His ex-wife had long since found someone else, and Bill was left alone, and started visiting Hannah, first just to talk, then for something more serious. Hannah knew perfectly well that Bill wasn't her match, and she had no plans to marry him. He was only good for passing the time. She couldn't rely on him for anything, but he did know how to give compliments, which was nice. Sometimes Hannah even thought she might be in love with him. Today, Bill said he'd drop by in the afternoon. Who knows, maybe he'll come. Hannah leisurely tidied up the house and sat down with a book in her favourite chair. After a moment of thought, she set the novel aside and went to the dresser where she kept her linens. Opening a drawer, she pulled out a cherished bottle of perfume, applying a drop to her neck. A bit of feminine joy. At that moment, there was a knock at the door. Bill! You're here, I'm glad to see you, the woman said, opening the door. The man looked at her with a self-confident smile. Were you waiting? What does it matter, since you're already here? Bill kicked off his boots, went into the living room and sat on the couch. You're a beautiful woman, Hannah. Do you think maybe we should get married after all? Hannah looked at Bill, unsure if he was joking or serious. I remember you got married once already. Wasn't that enough? It was enough, Bill laughed and pulled Hannah to him. When Bill left, Hannah realised, Luke will be home from school soon, and I haven't even made dinner. She peeled potatoes, put them on the stove and fried meatballs. Bill's visit, as always, left her with mixed feelings. Did Hannah think they should still be a family? Of course, she did. It was hard for her without a man, and Luke needed a father. But Bill was so unreliable, so careless, and that stopped Hannah most of all. And then a few days later, Hannah found out that Bill had started visiting Daria, who lived next door. To her surprise, she was both upset and relieved. On the one hand, she was offended that she had been so easily exchanged for another woman. But on the other hand, Hannah felt a strange freedom, as if deep down she had been burdened by this strange relationship. In any case, she began to treat Bill like an ordinary acquaintance. She could drink tea with him, talk about this and that, but she would not let him do more. And Bill put on a mask of surprise and incomprehension of her coldness and alienation. One Saturday morning, Hannah decided to go to the city. It was time to visit her mother-in-law. She tried to keep in touch with her, 
at least for her son's sake. So she sometimes brought pickles and jams she made herself. She always stayed only a short time and returned to her son. After loading the jars of pickles and jam into her bag, Hannah wandered to the bus stop. Suddenly, a car pulled up near the bus stop, and the door opened. "Are you waiting for the bus?" the driver asked. Hannah squinted at the man. He was pale, grey as a faded sweater, bald, with glasses and a skinny face. "Yes, I am," she nodded. "Why?" "Oh, just the bus ain't coming." The man waved his hands. "There was an accident. I was just driving by, so you don't need to wait." Hannah sighed. Probably I should give up on the trip," she thought. "And you're going into town?" the man asked, looking at Hannah. "I can give you a ride." The temptation to drive to the city was stronger than her fear of the driver, and Hannah nodded. "Let's go if it's on your way." Picking up her bag, she settled into the back seat. The car started up. The driver suddenly introduced himself. "My name is Patrick, and you?" Hannah shuddered. "I'm Hannah." She became embarrassed under Patrick's attentive gaze, her cheeks flushing. The conversation flowed smoothly into her visit with her mother-in-law. The man shook his head. "Why didn't your husband help you carry the bags?" "He couldn't," Hannah lied, blushing again. Patrick turned out to be a pleasant man. He worked as a cook in a restaurant and talked about his work and hobbies. The woman found herself liking Patrick, hanging on his every word. And what a pleasant voice he has! I could listen for ever," she thought. "Here we are." The car stopped in front of her mother-in-law's house. "Thank you. How much do I owe you?" the woman asked. "Don't insult me. It's a sin not to give a ride to a beautiful lady." Hannah felt embarrassed again, but there was no arguing. Patrick firmly refused to take the money, and they parted ways. After wishing her a good day. Patrick got into the car and drove away. Annette's apartment was spotlessly clean. The woman looked at Hannah with disdain and reluctantly invited her in. "Come in, I'll pour tea," the mother-in-law said as she walked. The conversation was short and practically meaningless. What did Hannah expect? Annette had never been warm towards her. She was probably still accusing her. Well, at least she adored Luke. After brief meeting. Saying goodbye, Annette slipped Hannah some money for a present for Luke. Let him visit during the holidays. I'm always glad to see him. For the first time, Annette smiled, and it suited her well. Of course he will. Hannah nodded and left the apartment. The weather was wonderful. Deciding to take a walk, she strolled past storefronts and street cafes. Suddenly, she saw a brightly coloured sign for a hair salon. Why not? She thought, "Today, Hannah especially wanted a change, perhaps a fashionable haircut or hair dye." Her thoughts drifted back to Patrick, his warm gaze and charming smile. The young hairdresser took a long look at her, examining her curls. "Are you sure you've decided to cut it so drastically?" "Yes, cut my hair into something shorter. I've had long hair all my life, and I want a change." Hannah nodded decisively. The girl took the scissors and began her magic on Hannah's hair. Hannah closed her eyes, almost dozing off, until she heard, "Done. Take a look." At first, Hannah didn't recognize herself. The mirror reflected a woman unfamiliar to her. Her cheeks were framed by long strands, and the back of her head was nearly bare. But what a transformation was achieved! "Don't you regret the length?" asked the hairdresser. No, I don't. Hannah shook her head and smiled. You're just magic. When Hannah got home, she went about her usual tasks: cooking dinner, tidying up. In the evening, Bill dropped by. Seeing her new haircut, he whistled. Oh wow, you look urban now. In love or what? Maybe you're right, and I'm in love. Hannah muttered. What do you care? It's like you got the wrong door. Yours is down the street. Come on, Hannah, chill out. Will you invite me in? No, Bill. Go back where you came from. I'm tired. Well, as you like. I won't insist. 
He turned and headed for the gate, while Hannah sat on the porch gazing into the starry sky. On the weekend, Claire and Brianna visited her. Brianna brought her daughter. Luke, taking the girl under his wing, showed her his books with bright pictures, and then took her for a walk in the settlement. The women sat on a bench under an old apple tree. "'How nice it is here, Hannah. I should move to the village. I'm tired of the city's constant hustle,' Claire said. "'And now confess. You're in love, right?' "'With whom?' Hannah laughed and suddenly blushed deeply. "'I know you never liked Bill. So you can both relax. Now he's dating my neighbour. It's over between us.' "'You, dear, are not fooling anyone. "'Eyes sparkling, new haircut, looking ten years younger.' "'Hannah couldn't hide from her friend's discerning gazes "'and had to tell them about Patrick. "'I don't think we'll see him again. "'He gave me a ride and forgot.' "'Hannah waved her hand dismissively. "'I once read that to make a wish come true "'you need to repeat the same phrase to yourself. "'For example, I met a good man.' Then your subconscious mind will tune in and it will come true, Brianna suggested. Hannah thought, I would like to see him again, and shuddered. A car pulled up to the house and a door slammed. The friends exchanged glances. Are you expecting someone? No, Hannah shrugged, but to her shock, Patrick was standing at her gate. The woman was surprised. How did he know her address? A smile played on his face, and she suddenly felt warm and cosy. "'I'm sorry, Hannah, for dropping without invitation.' "'Come in, since you're here,' she nodded. Claire and Brianna scrutinised the guest, glancing at each other. Hannah felt inexplicably uneasy. "'Why not have tea with us?' Claire smiled. "'Why not have tea with us?' Claire smiled. "'Try Hannah's pies. She's a master at them.' To Hannah's surprise, Patrick quickly blended in, meeting Luke, joking with her friends, sharing stories about his work, and even offering a couple of recipes. In the evening, when Claire and Brianna were leaving, he offered to drive them, but they declined. Claire had her car. Hannah was alone with Patrick, except for Luke, who remembered he hadn't done his math and settled on the count with his textbook. Hannah was torn by conflicting feelings. On the one hand, she felt like she should hint to Patrick it was time to leave, but on the other, she didn't want him to go. Oh, I forgot to say why I came. Patrick slapped his forehead. I'm getting old. Memory's failing. I found this in the car the next day. He took a tube of lipstick from his pocket. Here, you dropped it in my car. Mum, I can't do the task, Luke suddenly said. Let me see. Patrick took the textbook from the boy. Hannah watched the two heads bent over the textbook with a kind of pinched longing. It was Roger who should have been in Patrick's place. When the task was over, Hannah suddenly said, Luke, go to your room. And Patrick, it's already late. I'll see you out. The boy collected his books and left. Patrick looked anxiously at Hannah. Have I... have I offended you in any way? Have I embarrassed you? No. Well, it's just that it's really time for us to go to bed. I'm sorry, and thank you so much again. Okay, but please forgive me if I've done anything wrong. Hannah nodded and walked her guest to the gate. I just want to say one more time. Patrick hesitated, looking at Hannah, then at the apple tree growing near the gate. I'm sorry. I really don't know why I came here. I just... I just liked you very much. You're a really stunning woman. Beautiful? Hannah interrupted him. You just came because you liked me. And why are you all like that? Like what? Patrick asked in surprise. And then what? You'll come here on weekends, right? Or when Luke won't be home? Just to have a good time with a beautiful woman. But there's no one to fix a fence or an outlet. You know, no one. Just words. Beautiful woman. Take my advice. Look for another beautiful woman and drink tea with her. Hannah abruptly turned around and slammed the gate as hard as she could. 
Tears came to her eyes, and she wanted to howl with hopelessness. And how many more of these will be in my life? Bill, now this Patrick has fallen on my head, they need to relax, have a good time. And why not? They see that I am a lonely woman. They think that I hope for something, so they go to me. When will it end? And that stupid haircut. The woman went into the kitchen and sat down at the table, clutching her temples with her fingers. Thus she sat, almost till midnight, motionless, hunched, thinking of her unhappy fate. Maybe I had too much happiness with Roger, so God decided that I had had enough and didn't need to hope. Nobody needs me, only Luke, and therefore for his sake I must live. The woman fell asleep only in the morning. The whole next week passed as usual, work, home, conversations with her son. Bill visited Hannah twice, and both times she sent him away from the gate. He promised that he would certainly fix the outlet and the fence, and even the roof. But she didn't want to talk to him, let him go to his girlfriend, and make empty promises that he has no intention of keeping. Sunday morning the woman woke up early. She decided that today she would devote the day to rest. Of course, it would be possible to clean the house or wash the laundry accumulated during the week, but their work week was not easy, and Hannah wanted to sit in her favourite chair with a book to talk to her son about this and that. Hannah lay in bed for a long time, then slowly got up and woke Luke. Together they cooked pancakes for breakfast, and the woman suddenly realised that she felt happy. How good is it when you are in no hurry, just to be next to your son, and not think about anyone? Mum, there's a car outside. Luke looked up from the pancakes and peered out the window. Is it coming towards us? Hannah glanced in surprise at the car pulling up to the fence. Patrick, what does he want? I made it clear I didn't want to see him any more. The man got out of the car. Hannah frowned. She had been looking forward to spending the day with her son without any strangers. Meanwhile, Patrick took a black tool case from the trunk and timidly knocked on the gate. Then he shifted his gaze to the kitchen window and smiled. I'll open the gate for him, Mum. Without waiting for a reply, Luke ran to open the door for the uninvited guest. Hannah, hello. Patrick cautiously peeked into the kitchen, as if afraid she'd throw cookware at him. But Hannah shrugged indifferently. Good morning. Did I forget something of mine in your car again? No, nothing. Patrick smiled. You mentioned a broken outlet. I'm here to fix it, unless someone else has already done it. The woman looked at Patrick in surprise. You look beautiful, he added. She glanced at her outfit, a robe stained with flour, a laundered apron. Yes, definitely I looked great, she thought to herself. So where's the broken outlet? Patrick asked, looking around the kitchen. Hannah nodded. Then I'll turn off the electricity and get started, if you don't mind. You don't mind, do you? Hannah shook her head, still unable to speak. And Patrick did fix all the outlets in her house, checking the wiring and replacing the light bulb in the basement. Looking at all his efforts, Hannah felt obliged to ask him to stay for lunch. Patrick was reluctant, but Luke insisted he join them for a modest meal of simple pasta. Patrick gallantly praised Hannah's culinary talents. You're a cook, aren't you? Compared to you, my cooking is just childish babble, she joked. Oh, really? You're a talent, making delicious dishes from simple ingredients. For some reason, everyone thinks there's some kind of oat cuisine. But food is food. It's all about whether it tastes good or not. The man was going to leave after lunch, but Hannah, surprised by her own words, invited him to join her and Luke for a walk in the forest. Patrick agreed. Hannah was surprised to catch herself thinking she enjoyed talking to him. He didn't hint at anything, as Bill did, conversed with her and Luke, clearly enjoying their time together. Patrick left around nine o'clock in the evening, when Hannah was already nodding off and Luke was desperately yawning. I'm always lingering at your place, 
It's just unseemly to behave like this. Patrick smiled guiltily. But it's so nice here. I lose track of time. Come again. Hannah smiled sincerely. We'd love to see you. But I fixed all the sockets, so there's no more reason. Patrick said seriously, with a slight smile on his face. And I'll break some of them. You can fix it again, the boy suggested. You don't have to break anything, Hannah said sternly to her son, though her lips spread into a smile. Come on, we'll be glad to see you. The man began to visit every Saturday. He brought Luke intricate construction sets, shared adventure novels from his library, taught Hannah how to cook a few Italian dishes, and fixed her washing machine. The woman had grown accustomed to Patrick's visits, but she couldn't understand why he came so often. He never outwardly expressed any affection or tried to hug or kiss her. He acted more like a friend or even a brother. Only once, when she walked him to his car, did he suddenly embrace her, holding her tightly before releasing her and looking guiltily at his feet. Anna, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't scare you. You didn't? Not one bit. She placed both hands on Patrick's shoulders, kissed his cheek, then quickly brushed her lips against his. The man smiled. It's a good thing that I didn't scare you. I will come next week. Just wait for me. And Hannah eagerly anticipated Patrick's next visit. She felt something unusual might happen, something that would change her life. Perhaps these changes would finally be for the better. But her expectations were not met. On Saturday morning, there was a knock at the door. But it wasn't Patrick. It was Bill. He looked at her mockingly, then spat on the ground. Thought I wouldn't find out, huh? He hissed. Find out what? Hannah asked. She felt uneasy. It seemed that Bill had been drinking all night and was now in a foul mood. Why is some city guy visiting you? Why did you leave me? Huh? What are you talking about? Hannah tried to keep her voice emotionless, but she couldn't hide her excitement. Everyone says he comes here every Saturday. You're not shy to be with him in front of your son, are you? He stepped toward Hannah, and she backed away. Go home and sleep it off, she said. Come here. I'll prove I'm worth ten men like him. Bill hissed and tried to grab Hannah, but she dodged. Go home, better, she whispered. What do you want from me? I may love you, but you treat me like this. Hannah noticed with amazement the tears of drunkenness glistening on Bill's cheeks. Come here, I said. He grabbed her arm and yanked her toward him, and she barely kept her footing. Well... Do you love... Well, who do you love more, me or him? Bill attempted to kiss her. What's going on here? The man turned around abruptly to find Patrick standing in the doorway. Anna, who is this? An acquaintance, she replied briefly, and he's just leaving. Who said I was leaving? Bill released Hannah and stepped toward Patrick. I'm staying. It's you... You're leaving. Hey, quit going to my woman. You haven't been beaten up for a long time, have you? Hannah's throat went dry. She realised Bill would likely try to fight Patrick. Shall we step outside for the beginning? Patrick suggested calmly. Or are we settling things right here? Sure, let's go out. Bill grinned unkindly. Look, Hannah, there won't be a wet spot left for your friend. You'll learn how dangerous. Bill didn't finish. Patrick moved swiftly, smoothly sliding forward to intercept his hand and lightly pushed. Bill lost his balance and tumbled out the door like a sack of potatoes. Patrick watched tensely as Bill squatted and tried to get up, unable to, whether from the fall or the alcohol in his blood. Still want to talk? Patrick asked calmly. Or should I wait until you sober up? Damn you, Bill swore. Fine, I won't kill you in front of a woman, but you wait. And you, Hannah, wait too. I'll come back. Bill awkwardly rose and wandered to the gate. 
Once outside the fence, he kicked the wheel of Patrick's car and walked away. Hannah saw him off with a startled look. Who was that? Patrick asked. Is he really your boyfriend? No, he's not, she sighed sadly. He's my mistake. I got involved with him and now he's decided I belong to him for life. But wait, Patrick, how did you handle it so skillfully? He's bigger, stronger. He's drunk, Patrick shrugged, and I served in the army, learned some things there, plus I practiced karate. Skill is more important than strength. Thank you. You came just in time. I couldn't have handled him. Patrick suddenly squeezed Hannah's hands and spoke quietly. Take care of yourself. I can't always be nearby. Why? Hannah looked intently into his eyes. You can't, or you don't want to? I want to. I really do. But you said you don't need it. I'm willing to wait. Wait as long as it takes until you change your mind. I've already changed my mind. Patrick proposed six months later, and Hannah agreed. There were a few guests at the wedding, Claire, Brianna, Luke, and a few of Patrick's colleagues. When Patrick invited Hannah to dance for the first time as husband and wife, she felt as if her feet were about to lift off the floor, and she would soar like in the picture embedded in her memory. Why did you choose me? she asked quietly. Because that day at the bus stop, I saw the most beautiful woman in the world. Patrick replied succinctly. Hannah suddenly thought that Roger was now pleased for her and their son. Wherever he was, he would never deny her the right to happiness.' 